Hello. I want to welcome all of you to the fifth It Takes a Valley Virtual Town Hall. I'm Mary Randall, and I'm the chair of the Vale Health Foundation and will be your moderator today. I want to thank you for your support and interest in this topic. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, a little background. In December of 2019, the Vale Health Foundation announced its campaign, It Takes a Valley, Transforming Behavioral Health. The campaign is targeted to raise $100 million over 10 years for Eagle Valley Behavioral Health and many nonprofits across the Eagle River Valley. In June, we hosted our first virtual town hall as a way to share news and information. We wanted to showcase our partner nonprofits we're doing great work in behavioral health and to raise awareness about the campaign. We also wanted to share ways community members can make a difference. The past town halls have been recorded as this one will as well, and they are available on the foundation's website at valehealthfoundation.org. Today's topic, COVID-19, your mental and physical well-being, of course, is very timely and very important to all of us. We have an accomplished group of panelists today to share their thoughts with you. First, we have Chris Lindley, who's the Chief Population Health Officer for Vale Health. We have Dana Erpling, the Director of Operations for Eagle Valley Behavioral Health. Katie Jarnot, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction for Eagle County Schools. And Dr. Janet Engel at Colorado Mountain Medical, one of our great pediatricians. We will have questions after the uh, 45 minutes or so of presentations. You can enter your questions at any time using the key and Q&A feature at, on your screen, not the chat function. Um, now I'd like to introduce Chris Lindley, our Chief Population Officer for Vail Health. Thank you, Mary, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. At the same time, the presentation that I'm gonna be walking through here today um, has been shared in the chat function uh, for all of you guys to see. And if you'd like to share this presentation with any of your friends or family members, uh, feel free to do that. We update it every single day. Um, so it's available to send out to the community. Uh, first thing I wanna talk about is um, uh, the news. If you turn on the national news today or last night or read the paper, uh, across the country, the story is very negative. Um, but I want to highlight some things here locally that are very positive, and it's important that we keep this uh, positive outlook uh, as we go forward. First and foremost, which Katie will talk about, um, our kids have been very fortunate, and us as parents have been very fortunate, to actually have in-person learning. We're one of the only few places in the country today uh, that still has that, and that's the great work of our uh, school system as well as our public health uh, department in terms of doing that. We also have great child care in place. Um, again, across the country, many childcare facilities have been shut down. Here they continue to operate and at both locations, schools and in the childcare uh, setting, we've seen very few uh, school-based uh, infections, um, which is really remarkable and a good um, identification of how good a job the administration uh, of the school district is doing as well as the teachers that work there every day. We have substantial behavioral health resources and access across this community. Casey will talk a lot about that. Um, but when we look at our healthcare capacity, and I'm going to try to dive into this a lot. I know Dr. Jan Ingle will be talking about this as well. We're looking really good today. So while yes, hospitals across the state are definitely filling up and many are already full and at a very critical moment. Uh, today in our hospital, we have four COVID-19 patients, one in the ICU, three in the PCU, and two of those are going to be discharged today. So we're, we're, we're looking very good locally. Um, but also across the outpatient uh, clinic visits they're doing as well. We have robust testing capability across the valley. It has been free since March 4th and will continue to be free going forward. Um, anybody can get a test for any reason, no one is turned away, and we have a great supply of PPE on hand. Here's looking at the national data just briefly, and what I want to show you here is that the cases are definitely increasing. There was a dip here, and this is a reporting lag or survey bias due to lack of testing that took place over the Thanksgiving weekend. 
uh, but you'll see in the next days, this will continue to go up um, as it goes forward. The other thing to watch is the death uh, cases reported uh, per day. Yesterday was actually the highest day reported of deaths since the pandemic started. So I wanna make sure that sinks in a little bit. It was the highest day of single deaths yet reported. So today will certainly break yesterday and I would expect we'll see over 3,000, up above this number up here, 3,000 deaths reported today across the country. So when you hear folks saying, oh, there's more cases, but death isn't increasing, that is a complete fallacy. It's not true, because um, what you can see is the death rate, which is what we've been saying now for nine months, follows about two to three weeks from hospitalization. So we're gonna continue to see this death rate go up. And actually yesterday for the first time, CDC got on at prime time and actually delivered the appropriate message, which, meet, which said in the next 90 days, we'll probably double the amount of deaths we've seen in this country over the last nine months. Uh, this is looking at our hospitalization. Yesterday was also the highest level hospitalization ever in our country. Uh, today, uh, we'll probably pass 105,000 active hospitalizations in the country. In this other brown line, this is our percent positivity, which really relates down the road to hospitalizations. You can see it dipped a little bit here during the Thanksgiving holiday. A lot of folks said, oh, we're doing better. And what we've been saying is, no, it's going to increase. And you can already see that happening here today in the national data. This is looking at our hospitalizations across the state of Colorado. Also, yesterday at a record, record level, almost 2,000 total COVID-19 hospitalizations at the same time. When you go back to spring at the very highest, we actually had 880 uh, confirmed COVID-19 cases in the hospital and a few hundred more that were called PUD or patients under investigation uh, that did not come back as positive. So you can see we are now two and a half fold higher than we ever were during the uh, spring peak. A lot of folks have said, well, what's this whole new dial framework? And I could probably spend an entire hour on this, but I wanna just give you guys some points. It's made on, it, it, the decision of where, where your county lands is based on three measures. It's the number of new cases over a two week period. It's called a two week incidence rate. Uh, if you look at that specific measure, Eagle County today is definitely in the red category with an incidence rate of over 800. However, when you look at the other two measures that go into the dial framework, percent positivity where today we're right around 8%, that puts us uh, in the yellow category as well as hospitalizations where we're staying stable at about four patients every day on average over the past seven weeks, we're actually in the blue category there. So that's why today we are not in the red category. So while we have one major in the red, the other two are not in the red um, and they're actually trending in the right direction and I'll show you that data. Uh, this is Eagle County data. This is available. Anybody can look at this any day. Uh, you go to eaglecounty.org and you can find this information. You can see cases rapidly increased up through the Thanksgiving weekend. And then this last week they dropped a little bit. Uh, this is going to go up uh, as well. In fact, yesterday alone across our system, the Colorado Mount Medical and Bell Health System, we identified 30, three zero uh, additional positive COVID-19 cases. So uh, this number this week will be up in the 250s to put potentially even 300 again. So don't let this little dip here um, give too much optimism of the direction. It's still actually increasing. Um, but our system today is very stable. We have four outpatient clinics uh, with Colorado Mount Medical. They also operate the urgent care facilities throughout our valley. Our emergency department, uh, while they're seeing multiple what we call isolation patients today, folks coming in with COVID-like uh, illness, uh, many of those are, turn out to not be COVID. Uh, so that's great. There's a lot of other respiratory issues in the community we're identifying. Um, and our inpatient volume, so the capacity of our hospital, has been holding steady and I'll show you a graph of that so you can see it. We know and we expect uh, to see more COVID-19 patients. We're ready for it. Uh, the facilities have been prepared. Our proprietors are trained and ready and practiced across the whole organization. We have adequate PPE. I mentioned 90 days. Um, that's a lot of PPE on hand and we have robust uh, testing capability. But our biggest concern uh, without question is the increased uh, psychological strain, anxiety, and burnout 
on not only our providers in the, across the whole healthcare system from all the doctors and providers at Colorado Mountain Medical, but throughout the entire hospital, because um, this is just has been a relentless uh, ordeal over the last nine months. And we know we still got at least two to three more challenging months ahead of us. And I want, that's a big message I want folks to hear that while there is great news on the vaccine, and I'll talk a little bit about that, we have many more weeks ahead of us uh, where most of us will not get the vaccine and we're gonna have to continue to grind through this as we go forward. This is our dashboard that we look for, uh, at every day. This is what we report up to Will Cook, our CEO. And you can see it looks at all of our measures and I'm not gonna go through the detail, but you can see we're doing really, really well across our system. Uh, we only have two in the cautious uh, piece and that's percent of tests that are coming back positive are right at around 8% right in the middle. And then the number of staff we have that are out due to isolation and quarantine is 23 today, uh, which also puts us in the cautious. But it's important to realize we have 1,500 staff. So having 23 out is less than 2% of our workforce. So we're still doing very well comparatively. This is our hospitalizations. And you can see in the spring, we peaked out at 12 at two separate times. And this time, uh, our peak so far has been five, but we're averaging right around four. It is important to, no to note, though, in the spring, we actually transported 28 individuals to the front range for higher level of care. And this go around, we've only transported one person to the front range. And the reason why we've only transported one person to the front range is those hospitals are full and they're not accepting patients. But it also shows that we've done an amazing job managing those patients, not only in the hospital and getting them back out to the community, but even more importantly, managing them out in the outpatient setting across all of Colorado Mount Medical, where they're doing just a fantastic job uh, keeping those folks out of the hospital. This is our percent positivity. We look at it on a trailing seven days. You can see we tapped out here just under 14%, and fortunately, it's been going down. I think we will see it start to level off, maybe uh, increase a little bit, but I, I don't think we're going to get back to these high percentages that we were at just uh, six weeks ago. This is the outpatient uh, data across Colorado Mount Medical. Um, what I just want to show you here is in the spring, we were really getting hammered at their sick clinics. They were very, very busy. It picked up in the summer. They definitely felt it. And while it has picked up here, it's really maintained under 50 uh, per day on average, which is um, absolutely manageable. This is just a breakdown of the 23 staff I talked about that were out uh, of work today due to either isolation, that means you have COVID-19, or quarantine, which means you've been exposed to someone with, uh, with COVID-19. This is the last one I wanna kind of go over before I jump in a little bit of a vaccine update, and that is the outlook, oops, sorry, the outlook for us, um, again, is remains optimistic, remains positive. We are very aware of what's going on nationally. We're watching it. Um, but here locally, a lot of things have taken place over the last nine months that it's important that everybody knows about. We have now real-time data integration across the Bell Health system. So that means we can see what's happening within Colorado Mount Medical every day. And I showed you some of those graphs. We're looking at those every day. And likewise, we know what's happening in our hospital. We know what's happening out in the public health setting at our testing sites. We know our local case fatality rate is much lower than the national, level, uh, national average. It's also lower than the state average. Um, our staff are trained and experienced. We've treated a lot of COVID patients um, and they feel very comfortable doing that. Uh, we have a much better surge plan. In fact, in March, we had two negative air pressure rooms, just two, and we had only used one of those in the previous three years. <laughs> one patient, one time in a negative pressure room the previous three years, and now we have 22 negative pressure rooms, and any COVID patient that comes in goes into one of those negative pressure rooms, so it's working out really well. We also just this week moved out of our old emergency department into the new East Wing, where we have a brand new emergency department, and we decided to keep the old emergency department intact and ready to go, so there's 20 additional beds there that are fully ready to be used as surge should we need them if we get um, additional COVID-19 patients. So that's something uh, we, we didn't have any capacity like that in the spring. Uh, our stockpile is, is, is robust. And in fact, all the frontline providers now have PAPRs that they can use. Those are those 
purified air respirators. They kind of look like a spacesuit. Um, those are deployed across our entire organization. We have free testing capacity throughout the whole thing. Uh, three COVID-19 sick clinics um, and improved therapeutics and, and treatments. Um, this is just a quick question we get, and sorry you can't see this here with the stuff up here, but people keep asking, how is it that Vail Health, your hospital in, in, in this valley, is not full with patients where we hear all the other hospitals are getting full? And I think it's because of, of these four things I wanna cover quickly. We've had an amazing testing effort across our valley. Uh, this has really been led by Colorado Mount Medical since March. Um, providing testing across all of their locations, as well as the community testing site in Avon. Uh, now we have additional testing sites. We also have one in Bell, and we also have one in Summit County we're running. Uh, but the great thing is if you go in and you're sick at Colorado Mount Medical, you can get a rapid test right away. And you get your results in 10 to 20 minutes. So this really helps people make the right decision based on if they know they're positive or not. And it really helps with compliance. Um, the sick clinics uh, are up and running, and I'll let Dr. Um, Engel talk about that. The community has done an amazing job protecting our vulnerable populations. And so we've done really well keeping COVID out of places like Castle Peak. Um, I do want you guys to know there is an outbreak at Castle Peak today. It's something we're working on with them, um, but we've done a really good job protecting that population and others that are high risk. Um, but the last one is we have a very healthy underlying population. And what I mean by that is we actually have some of the lowest rates of obesity, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes in the country. And that has a direct relationship because we know those three things specifically are the highest risk factors outside of age that lead someone to be hospitalized for COVID-19. So I think that plays a big part in that. I'm going to jump down here real quick because I want to talk about the vaccine before I turn it over. There's three vaccines that are going to probably be available to our community in the next 90 days. The, the first one, the Pfizer one that we're all hearing about, uh, will actually uh, probably arrive at Bell Health by December 15th. So two weeks from now, we're expecting to get that vaccine. In fact, we're doing a full scale exercise Monday or Tuesday next week with the National Guard where we're going to be simulating the receiving of the vaccine uh, from the front range, securing it in our ultra cold uh, storage unit, and then de, um, uh, breaking it down, getting it ready uh, to be given to employees. I wanna talk a little bit about who's gonna get the vaccine and who's not, because there's a lot of, I think, false uh, information out there. And you know, watching the nightly news, I see where people get it. I think a lot of folks think on December 15th, we're gonna have vaccine in this community for, for everybody. That couldn't be more from the truth. In fact, for most of us on this call today, including myself, we will not get vaccinated till April, May, June, or July. So we have at a minimum 90 days, if not more, before we will get vaccinated. And the reason why is there's a very limited supply of vaccine in this country, and it's gonna be allocated to states on a population basis. And then within the states, it's gonna be prioritized based on those that deem need it the most. And so within our community, uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health Environment and Eagle County Public Health Department have allocated or prioritized, if you will, hospital care workers treating COVID-19 patients as those as the highest uh, risk to getting COVID and those that should get the vaccine first, as well as those living in nursing home and long-term care facilities. The very specifics of how many exact doses we'll get in two weeks how many people will be able to vaccinate is still unknown at this time, but we're expecting somewhere around 200 to 250 doses that we'll be able to administer to our staff in the next few weeks, which we're very excited to do that. It's important to also note that there's not going to be any deviations in this valley to the requirements. So no matter who you might be or who you might know, is not going to get you a vaccine in this valley because we have to follow CDPHE and Eagle County um, public health requirements. In fact, every vaccine has to be reported to the C uh, CDPHE within 24 hours on their secure electronic reporting system. And if there's any deviations of allocations, i.e. we give a shot to someone that doesn't meet uh, the criteria, i.e. Um, I get a shot and I'm not a frontline healthcare worker, that puts 
us all at risk for not getting future supplies of vaccines for our communities. So we are gonna to stick to the requirements and follow them verbatim. Uh, it's also important for folks to know that once you're vaccinated, you're still gonna be required to follow public health protocols. These vaccines take two doses over a 30 day period, and it still takes your body time even after a second dose to build the antibodies that you need to be protected. So once we get the vaccine, we're not out of the clear. We still got a, some more work going. So I'm gonna stop there and see if there's any questions and then hand it over to the next speaker. Yeah, we're gonna take questions at the end. Um, so uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Dana Erpling, Director of Operations for Eagle Valley Behavioral Health. Great, thank you, Mary. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about Eagle Valley Behavioral Health on some of the work that we were doing prior to the pandemic um, and ways that we're working to support the community now with COVID. So Eagle Valley Behavioral Health was formed as a 501c3 nonprofit in July of 2019, and we were fully staffed in October. So we just came up on our one year anniversary, and we feel so fortunate as a community that we were able to put behavioral health resources in place before the pandemic because we recognize how that social isolation, economic struggles, the school and business shutdowns have really taken a toll on the mental health of our entire community. Um, Eagle Valley Behavioral Health is designed to be the collaborative backbone organization to work in a collective impact model with all of the nonprofits and community partners that have been working on behavioral health issues for the past several years. Um, and we work on um, really working to impact eight key behavioral health initiatives that include the design and construction of a cross-functional behavioral health facility in our valley, increasing provider access and capacity, system coordination, increasing prevention and education, crisis response, school-based services, innovation, and behavioral health business line oversight. And so we know that the state of behavioral health prior to COVID um, was pretty dismal. Um, you know, the Western United States has historically been dubbed the suicide belt and Eagle County is no different. Over looking at our hospital data over the past five years, we saw that visits to Vail Health's emergency department for anxiety and depression jumped 465% in five years. Um, and so we knew that we really needed to take action. Eagle, Eagle Valley Behavioral Health, we actually conducted a community survey to get baseline data on behavioral health. And we performed that survey in January and finished that in early March. And little did we know um, how valuable that baseline data would be prior to the pandemic hitting. And so before COVID, we found that our residents report a high number of uh, poor mental health days, almost double that of the US average. So here in Eagle, 42% uh, of our residents reported having a high number of poor mental health days per month. The US average is 28%. 30% of our residents stated that they felt lonely on a routine basis. And we had a very high percentage of residents who were considered excessive drinkers. So over 45% in Eagle compared to the US average of 18%. And keeping in mind, this, this was all prior to the pandemic hitting. I'm actually gonna share the presentation that Chris was just looking at because we do have some behavioral health specific data um, and information that we can share. Let me pull this up here really quick. Um, looks like I'm having some issues with the share screen. Um, so rather than doing that, I can just talk through the slides that we had here. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, with COVID hitting, we have some pretty significant behavioral health trends that we're seeing in the community. Again, due to that physical isolation, the lack of social connection, school closures, the widespread economic impact and uncertainty. Um, and we've been working with our community partners to collect data. And what we've seen is an increase in domestic violence crisis calls an increase in crisis calls to the Eagle Hope Center, um, an increase in students reaching out looking for support as they've been doing virtual um, or uh, hybrid learning. And so again, we feel really fortunate that we do have a lot of resources in place to, to support our behavioral health in our community. And I can talk through a few of those. The big one that we really wanna promote um, and have everyone participating today promote with the community is Olivia's Fund. So Olivia's Fund is a scholarship program 
has a very easy application. If you go to www.eaglevalleybh.org backslash Olivia's Fund, you can find the application. It takes just minutes to complete and um, applicants are immediately connected to local providers that can provide up to six free behavioral health sessions, either for behavioral health or for substance use. We also wanted to promote integrated behavioral health, both at CMM and at Mountain Family Health Centers. So that's where you can walk in to see your primary care physician and if they identify that you need behavioral health support, or if you're just looking to connect with a physician, you can go sit in the waiting room of your local primary care office. Nobody knows why you're there. There's absolutely no stigma and you can see a licensed behavioral health clinician. It's very easy, um, very confidential. We also have three new behavioral health navigators in place at Eagle County Paramedics. They're bicultural, bilingual, and so we recognize that navigating behavioral health system can be quite a challenge. These individuals can help you navigate insurance questions. They can help you find a provider that can meet your needs. They can link you up with a local peer support group, um, so they're a great resource. We also have a new insurance navigator who's housed at CMM, but can see anybody in the community. So if you have insurance, but you're struggling to get your insurance to cover behavioral health sessions, they can really help you navigate that as well. We also have a new intensive outpatient program or IOP at CMM. So that's for individuals who might not need inpatient services, but they need a little bit higher care than what you can see in an outpatient setting. So we have that now for adults and for adolescents. And we're also increasing resources for substance use in the community. We've got a new addiction specialist. Um, we're also uh, having a new psychiatrist hired at CMM after January. So we've really been able to increase the, the number of resources in the community. Um, again, our resource uh, or website at www.eaglevalleybh.org has a provider directory where you can use um, a, a filter to look for all the local providers based on location, whether or not they take insurance, their um, availability, so you can find all of the providers that are available in the community. Um, we're also looking to expand our employee assistance program called Mountain Strong in the next year. And that will really increase access for employers across the Valley who want to make behavioral health services more readily available for their staff. Um, so that's just uh, kind of a high level overview. We're also launching a new peer support program in the new year. So that will include peer support for the Latinx community, for veterans, for um, healthcare workers, um, for those looking for substance use support. Um, one of the things we have found with the pandemic is substance use has increased quite significantly and that's an area of concern. So we're looking to put resources in place to help with that as well. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, now, uh, I want to introduce Katie Jarno, who is the Assistant Superintendent in, of Curriculum and Instruction for Eagle County Schools. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, Eagle County Schools is one of the only very few districts in the state that has been doing in-person learning since the first day of school in August, and we're quite proud of that fact. Um, most districts either started remote and never got to in-person learning, or some districts just stuck with remote learning. Um, some are going to be remote for the entire school year. Um, it's important to point out that this is in part due to our teachers' willingness to be in person. That's what allows us to, to be able to teach kids in person. In a lot of districts, the teacher association has not been willing uh, to be in person, and we're fortunate to have a great relationship with our teacher association and to have been able to work together to support the in-person learning. Um, our elementary schools are in class size cohorts and they are in school four days per week. Our middle schools are in grade level cohort, cohorts. They are also four days per week. And um, because of the size of our high schools, um, each is approximately a thousand students. We're using a hybrid model so that half of the students are in the building at any given time. Um, high school students have two days of in-person learning per week. Uh, we also offer fully remote options at all levels so that families who feel unsafe or uh, if someone has an underlying health issue, um, they can safely learn remotely. Uh, cohorting students in this way really allows us to easily contact trace and to only quarantine students who've been exposed. So most students are still in school and we only have small groups that are out for the quarantine period. Um, we follow the quarantine guidelines that are provided by public health. 
Um, and I understand that that may be changing in the future. So if that guidance changes, we will be following the new guidance. Um, we have had to quarantine groups at every level in almost every school. Um, we have only had one school, Eagle Valley High School, uh, that has had to go fully remote, um, and they were only remote for two days. So um, to be clear, there are two reasons that a school would be fully remote. Um, one reason is because there is too much illness and transmission within the school. Uh, the other reason is because the school has had too many adults that have been quarantined or tested positive, and operationally, the school just can't function. Um, that is what happened at Eagle Valley High School. Um, they just didn't have enough adults. Um, I was actually there one day substitute teaching, uh, which I enjoyed very much, but um, I also have another job I need to be doing as assistant superintendent. Um, so we're working on um, a public facing dashboard that will illustrate the numbers of students and teachers who are in quarantine, who have tested positive, and um, how many teachers we have out so that anyone can see what those numbers are at any given moment. Um, we're trying to be very transparent about the way that we are cohorting and quarantining students. Um, I want to be clear that it was not because of transmission within the school that Eagle Valley High School was remote. Um, in fact, um, as Chris mentioned earlier, we have had very, very little transmission of COVID within the schools. Um, we are seeing the transmission happening at home, uh, in the workplace, and through social gatherings. Um, we're also seeing students who um, are out on quarantine and are still going to their part-time jobs. Um, so we really need for students and adults who are quarantined to be staying home and following those quarantine orders. Our goal is to safely keep as many students in person as long as possible. Um, remote learning is not an ideal learning environment for the vast majority of students. There are some students who love it, um, and we have always had remote options, and we will continue to have remote options even post-COVID, um, but remote learning is not the way to learn for most um, students. Um, it is difficult, it's frustrating, and it's simply not as engaging as in-person learning. Um, being an independent learner is a very hard thing, and most people don't become independent in their learning until they get to college. So you can imagine it's very hard for kids to engage in material on their own. Um, it's difficult for students, especially the young ones, to figure things out by themselves, and they really need their teachers to guide them. Um, expecting parents to be teachers is also not the answer. Um, there are reasons that teachers have to have at least a bachelor's degree, be licensed by the state, engage in continuous professional learning. Um, teaching is really hard and there's more to it than meets the eye. Uh, I think a lot of parents found that out when we were fully remote last spring. Um, secondary teachers have to be highly qualified in their subject areas, which means they not only hold a degree in their subject area, but in education as well. Um, we find that parents are really good at classroom management and discipline, um, but parents have a different relationship with their kids than teachers, and it makes it really hard to provide interventions and make lessons engaging or, or help their, their kids when the academic process gets really tough. Um, remote learning also, I think the, the biggest drawback to remote learning is that it does not provide for socialization. And we all know that um, humans are social beings, young humans are especially social beings, and uh, so that, that those friendship groups and that socialization is essential to our young people. The mental well-being of our kids is negatively impacted by isolation. Being away from friends and missing out on, you know, quintessential events like birthday parties and football games and homecoming and other traditionally exciting and fun times that are part of childhood leads to anxiety and depression or exacerbates anxiety and depression in our kids. Um, and our adult educators are, are struggling with it as well. I've felt it. Um, we got into this business to be with kids, not to be separated from them by a computer screen. So um, obviously in-person learning for a lot of reasons is, is absolutely the best choice. Um, the other piece about in-person learning that I think has a, a wider impact um, 
the idea that educators are babysitters is extremely offensive in the education community. Um, but we have had to just get over that and realize that school is the vehicle that allows parents to work outside the home. And our economy depends on in-person learning so that parents can go to work um, or they can actually get work done if they are working from home. Um, parents can't go to work um, because they have to stay home with children and they begin to experience financial difficulties or their financial difficulties are exacerbated. Um, then that leads to food insecurity, homelessness, um, and a level of stress in the home that too often ends in abuse or neglect. So when parents are stressed, we see that stress inevitably impacting the children. So again, our goal is to keep as many students safely in-person learning for as long as possible. Um, we do need the community to help us with that goal. We need parents to be role models. Practice the five commitments of containment. Wear your mask. Don't gather in large groups. Um, and mostly keep kids home if they aren't feeling well. Um, one thing that we also ask from the community is, is some grace. None of us has ever done our job during a pandemic before. Uh, Rob Parrish, who's the principal at Battle Mountain High School, pointed out to me last fall that um, we all became first year teachers on March 13th because none of us has ever done this before. Um, and for the record, your first year of teaching is the absolute hardest year of your entire life. Um, so we're all having to figure this out and to adapt to a constantly changing landscape. So it's important to understand that every single thing we do is to keep our kids safe, healthy, and well-educated. Um, and finally, I would just like to point out that it is all the people in our district, our, our teachers, our administrators, custodians, office staff, district leaders, everyone who has been working harder than they've ever worked before um, to make this all happen. Um, teachers are having to plan for in-person and remote learning. That's twice as much planning as they've ever done before. Elementary teachers are providing all of the instruction in their classes, including um, their specials classes, and that takes a ridiculous amount of planning. But through all that, we've been able to cohort, we've been able to um, quarantine in small groups and keep the large majority, you know, greater than 90% of our students in person up to this point. So we have an amazing team in our district um, and we're, we're so grateful. They are frontline workers, our teachers, and they are extremely dedicated to helping our kids through this. Um, but we also couldn't do it without the community support. So we're, we're grateful for all your support as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. And to your team, congratulations for all your hard work. And now I want to turn it over to Dr. Janet Engel from Colorado Mountain Medical. Thank you. I'm glad to be part of this panel. And uh, thank you, Katie, for all the work that you and the school district is doing. Um, I was just going to briefly go over um, the symptoms of COVID and things to look for and uh, the testing capacity we have now and how we're running all our clinics. Um, so the interesting thing about this SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 is that there are so many different symptoms that people can prevent, present with that um, some people don't even realize that they have it um, and be asymptomatic and be going about their day and going about their work and their social life and not realize that they are spreading it and other people can be very sick from the get-go um, and know right away that they're sick. Um, the symptoms can vary anywhere from um, very mild, very mild cough, little sore, sore throat, um, to very florid fever, shortness of breath, um, chest pain, headache, body aches, similar to what people think of with the flu, um, but this one comes on very differently. Um, there's an interesting symptom of loss of taste and smell um, that is really one of the hallmarks of this illness that uh, almost always means positive. Almost every time we get a patient with those symptoms, they are, um, they come in and we're, we find they're positive or if their initial test is negative, test them a few days later, um, they are positive. So those are symptoms that we don't see with really any other illness or um, virus. Um, we can also get um, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, um, rarely rashes. There was 
concern um, early uh, in the spring and summer with um, some children getting um, a multi-system infl inflammatory um, syndrome. It's actually quite rare, even though people were very concerned because the press gave it a lot of uh, time and energy. Um, but that uh, caused very, very florid sickness in kids, including um, low blood pressure, uh, need for hospitalization, bad rashes, uh, bleeding, things like that. Um, so this this virus is is um, an enigma to everybody. We're all learning it. We haven't even been learning it for a full year. And as Katie said, everybody became a new teacher um, in March, and we all became new clinicians in March because we had to learn a whole new way of uh, of doing things and had to teach our staff a new way of uh, of evaluating patients and new new things to tell people on the phone. Um, everything new PPE that we've all learned to use, but now really are very familiar with. Um, so it's, it's definitely tested the whole system. Um, I wanna say I've been in the Valley for 17 years and the collaboration in this Valley in the last year has been amazing. And just, I'm so proud to be a part of it between Vail Health, CMM, Eagle Valley Behavioral Health, uh, Public Health, the school system, it's just across the board, everybody has just stepped up and worked together um, to really make sure that our Valley has done so much better um, than across the, across the nation. Um, so right now, the way that we are running things for CMM and Vail Health is we have designated sick clinics um, for people that are, have, that are ill, that wanna be seen by a provider, um, that are worried about symptoms, that have any illness, we are seeing them in a designated sick clinic in Eagle, in our office um, on the first floor of the Eagle building. Um, also in Vail at the hospital, in our office, we have designated sick area, and then at the Avon Urgent Care. Um, CMM also has well clean clinics um, at our office in Eagle, in the upstairs of the building. Um, at Avon at the Buck Creek building, we are not allowing sick patients at all in that building, and then um, at the Vail office as well. Um, so again, sick clinics are really, we're, we're separating all of the sick from the um, well so that people can still be comfortable getting their care for um, their wellness and for other concerns that don't have anything to do with COVID-19. Um, the big thing is that we really wanna make sure we're not missing routine things, we're not missing cancers, we're not missing things because people are afraid to come in. Um, in March, people were definitely afraid um, of coming to the doctor's office thinking that they were going to uh, get sick just from walking in. And we are doing everything in our power to keep those that um, do not have symptoms of COVID from those that, that do. And really it's, it's worked well. It's worked well in that our staff and the staff of Vail Health has not um, really gotten sick. Those that are around it every single day, the numbers that have actually gotten this virus is, is so low. Um, and everybody who has gotten it, mostly has gotten it from a social situation um, and not at work where we know we're exposed. So, um, so the PPE does work when it's, when it's used. Um, we have our testing sites that where people are not seen by a provider um, there's one in Avon, there's a, a trailer there. Uh, there's also a site at Vail Health at the, um, at the hospital. And then we also have testing at, um, in Summit County. And turnaround times for tests, if you're seen in the sick clinic, we have um, a rapid test that is a 10 to 20 minute test as Chris pointed out. Um, some of those are PCR, some of those are molecular tests. Right this minute, it, changes honestly minute to minute because of supplies. But right this minute, we are using a PCR test. So I know there was a question about that in our um, rapid tests. Um, and then um, we have molecular tests at the testing sites that take 24 to 48 hours. Um, if, they're, if they're tested at the hospital site, they um, sign up for their hospital portal and they get their results through the hospital portal. Um, so there is testing available and it is much more rapid. Early on, we were getting tests 14 days after someone was tested and they were already back to work and um, had exposed people. Um, but now we are not. 
um, we have much, much faster turnaround. Um, we're trying not to send tests out. They're all done um, pretty much in, in the Valley. Um, again, I wanna stress what Katie said also is that kids are not getting this at school. They are getting this at, in social situations. They're getting it at home. They're getting it um, being with their friends. They're getting it with holidays, with families. So um, the commitments of containment are the most important thing to, to really prevent um, the spread of this disease. We need to help protect our vulnerable. Yes, many people are asymptomatic and can get through this, but the number of people that get sick is staggering. We have lost, pretty soon we'll have lost 300,000 Americans to this virus. And it's very sad that some people don't take the commitments very seriously. Um, so social distance, wash your hands, wear your mask, stay home if you're sick, um, get tested. That's the one thing we really wanna stress is that get tested. There, is, there should be no stigma with someone admitting that they have a symptom and that they need to be tested. And employers and everybody should um, you know, understand that people are going to have to miss work. Everybody's learning to work from home. Um, and we wanna have people feel free to get tested right away it's a fast test, so um, you know we, we know results the same day. Um, I also want to stress a little what Katie said about quarantine. If people are in quarantine, that means you're home and not out and about in the community. We get people calling from the grocery store um, asking questions about their quarantine, um, and even people who are in isolation that are still doing their grocery shopping on their own. So I want to stress that um, that we need to actually stay home if we're in isolation or quarantine. Um, the CDC has just come out with some guidelines to possibly decrease the time for um, the isolation and quarantine, and we're gonna wait for public health to tell us what to do from there. Um, and as Chris said, people are calling us daily about the vaccine. And as soon as we know every, anything about the availability to the public, we will let everybody know, but right now, we don't know. We're looking forward to, to having that and hopefully having a better spring than we did last year. Thank you so much, Dr. Engel. Um, I know that Chris Lindley needs to leave here in, in uh, a couple of minutes. So uh, we're going to take questions first, and I'm going to direct the questions to Chris first. And then, um, Chris, we know you're very busy, so uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, and I want to thank all the rest of the panelists as well. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. Um, Chris, uh, question has come up. Uh, does the 10 person to household limitation apply to outdoor activities also? As it stands today, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Um, then the next question for you is, how do you think COVID-19 impacts the winter ski season? What would trigger the local ski mountains to close uh, or moving us to purple? Um, oh my God, this is the, the hardest question I, we have. Um, these are my own thoughts. These are not the thoughts of Bell Resorts uh, or other partners in the ski industry. Um, I, I'm very optimistic. We're gonna continue to have a ski season this year. I don't think it'll be like ski seasons we've had in the past. I think uh, because of the limited limitations that are put on our restaurants, um, in retail, there'll be less visitors here this year, and we're already starting to read about that in some surveys that they're doing that less people are planning to ski this year for a host of reasons. Um, but I think we're going to maintain the mountains being open. Um, I know in this valley, uh, the, the whole community, restaurants, retail, hospitality, uh, the mountain are doing the absolute best they can to be as cautious and appropriate. They're all following procedures. And as we've, we've talked about, the, and Dr. Engel talked about, you know, that the virus is transmitting in the private setting in homes and events. It's not taking place uh, across our retail establishments. So that is a, a bit of optimism. As it relates to purple, well, we're not in red, so let's not jump to purple yet. Um, we're trying not to go to red. Um, and as I mentioned in my slide, we, while we're in red on incidents, uh, we are not in red on percent positivity, nor are we red on the status of our healthcare system. Uh, we actually locally this last week and a half have been making improvements on all measures. Um, I think we are all committed, uh, private business, government, healthcare community, and just all of our residents on 
continuing to move in the right direction and not going red. Thank you, Chris. Um, this one uh, is for uh, either Chris or Janet. Um, and that has to do with probably uh, Dr. Engel, the loss of sense of smell. Um, it's been reported that some people have, have not been able to regain their, their sense of smell. Um, do people lose it permanently? And if not, are there things they should be doing to try to bring back their sense of smell uh, more rapidly? Well, it's funny to say permanently when we've only been dealing with this virus for <laughs> this year. So I, I don't think we quite know that answer. The vast majority of the people have gotten their sense of smell and taste back. It can take months. So I think we're, we're very early to, to really be able to say if anything is going to be permanent. We do know that this virus can cause some long-term um, symptoms and some people have what's been termed long COVID um, where their, their symptoms, especially things like fatigue, body aches, um, brain fog, things like that can last a lot longer than most viruses. So um, could it be permanent? Possibly. Um, I think, you know, working on our overall health, decreasing hypertension, diabetes, um, obesity, exercise, diet, sunshine, sleep, all of that is, is going to help us all get through this, um, regardless of whether you've had it or not. I think those would be the things to help bring back any of your health is just to, to really focus on the things that we know we can control. Okay, um, Katie, this one's for you. What do you think the long-term effects of the pandemic will be on our local school-age children? Are, we, are you seeing trends locally or nationally or internationally that are concerning that the school district will be addressing? Sure, so I think that um, we definitely um, are concerned about some drops in um, skills in our, especially our early learners. Like I said, it's very hard to learn reading on your own. Um, and so we are addressing that. We have um, already, even last spring, um, we purchased curricular um, intervention materials to help with that and we will be looking at those moving forward but i do want to say that we also find some we call them covid silver linings and we do find some things that we've had to change in our schooling that are actually a positive so um, for instance because we're not pulling groups out of out of classes our school counselors are getting into classes more they're teaching kids in the class setting they're building relationships not just with the kids who might seek them out but with other kids as well. So that's a silver lining. Some of the scheduling things that, that we've done, we, um, especially at Eagle Valley High School, and I'm not talking about the hybrid model um, necessarily, but just the way that we're scheduling kids um, has been a, a real positive. Um, and I do think some of the things that we are able to do remotely, some of the teaching practices that we've instituted, um, using a flipped classroom where you're not just assigning homework, but kids are doing some of the um, learning at home and then the practice in class. So there are some silver linings there too, um, but we are concerned. Um, we have something called summer slump that we deal with every year when kids are off for the summer and they're not reading and they're not keeping up. Um, and we see that summer slump that is magnified tremendously and, and we will need to address that. And we are, are already addressing that, but also planning that for the future. Okay, thank you. Um, Dana, uh, it's been asked if you could explain uh, how uh, Eagle Valley Behavioral Health is organized. Yeah, great question. So we are a team of eight. Um, we're a pretty flat organization. Um, most of us report up to Chris. So I'm the director of operations. So I oversee more of the administrative financial. Dr. Casey Wolfington on our team oversees um, clinical programming um, and outreach with providers. Michelle Debos on our team oversees community outreach and um, Latinx programs. Um, Mike Richards on our team oversees IT systems and data analytics. And then Jerry Lopez oversees youth engagement. He reports to Michelle. Um, Kayla Bettis on our team reports to Casey. She's also a licensed clinician and oversees the peer support programs 
and special populations, including veteran services. And then Claire reports to me and she helps um, on administrative and financial tasks as well. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question for you. Uh, are you interested in community partners for inpatient psychiatric uh, treatment and how, how are you referring individuals who need testing? So is the question um, community partners in assisting mm -hmm. as we look towards building an inpatient facility? Well, I, yes, I, I think that that's correct as well as uh, people that need, need treatment now because we don't have an inpatient facility, what, what happens to them now? Yeah, so right now, if an individual needs inpatient hospitalization, unfortunately, we do have to send them out of the community, either to the Denver metro area or to Grand Junction. And that is our hope with building the facility here Mid Valley is that we will no longer have to send people out of the community. We um, are building programs, like I said, um, including like the intensive outpatient program, where we can provide that higher level of support so that we have programs in place prior to individuals needing uh, inpatient treatment. But unfortunately for those that really do need inpatient support, we do have to send them out of the community right now. As far as engagement with other community partners, yes, absolutely. If there's any organizations or community partners out there who are looking to engage with us, we would really encourage them to reach out to us. Um, because like I said earlier, we know that working together collaboratively, we can do more than working on our own. So absolutely, we'd, we'd um, appreciate any community partners interested to reach out to us. Great, thank you. Um, and um, for Dr. Engel, um, can you talk about the best practices for preventing the spread of COVID in our community? We, we know sort of the normal things, but maybe you can hit those high points again, uh, just as a reminder to everyone, especially with the spread more likely happening in small group settings. Right. Um, I think I, I can't stress enough the importance of wearing masks when you're in public. Um, simple things like masks and hand washing um, are more important than, than people realize. Um, but then staying home, honestly, just socially distancing, um, avoiding uh, areas that are crowded, avoid, avoiding, it's the social situations, unfortunately. And as Katie said, we are all social beings and our children are social beings and we need to be around other people, but at a time like this, in order to protect each other, the socially distanced um, activities are the best. Um, outdoor activities are much safer than indoor activities. Um, I don't recommend that people go home and use Lysol on their houses every day if they've not had any contact with anybody. I don't think that is something that's gonna help. I don't think buying all of the uh, cleaning supplies from Costco I don't think that's going to help. It's just being smart with our contacts. It's limiting our social situations. It's a little bit of self um, deprivation, if you will, because we can't do the things that we normally want to do because we really want to get through this. Um, and unfortunately, it, we, it, it's coming at a holiday time, which is going to increase the trouble with the mental health. Um, and it's a time when we usually surround ourselves with family and fun. And this year we're gonna have to figure out different ways to do family and fun um, because it's very simple. You don't get close to someone who could potentially have the virus. Thank you. Well, I wanna thank all of our panelists and all of you for attending this informative session. If you have questions that did not get answered, um, you can email us uh, at at um, uh, one of the emails, Amy, maybe you can, or, or one of the people from the foundation will send out a, a follow-up email if you have other questions. Um, it's important to remember that Eagle Valley Behavioral Health is a model that we think can be replicated in other communities across the country. And our leadership and the leadership of all of the people on this call today really make this important. Um, I encourage you to visit ittakesavalley.org to learn more about our campaign, Eagle Valley Behavioral Health and its partners, to make a donation and to sign up for our foundation's uh, 
Prevail uh, newsletter. And I also noticed that on the chat function, Amy did put in here the, the, uh, the email address for questions. It's foundation at valehealth.org if you have additional questions. We appreciate everyone's time and thank you all and have a healthy and safe holiday season. Thank you. Thank you.